All right, I'm here with the human vessel for the Halo franchise, Mr. Frank O'Connor. How are you doing, sir? I'm capacious. Thank you. <laughs> how, does it, how does it feel being the living embodiment of this uh, of this hallowed video game franchise? Are you comfortable in that role? I'd be comfortable as Cortana at this point. Yeah, it's, uh, we're nearly done, actually. We've got a couple of weeks before we're, we're really, really, really done. And then a few weeks of manufacturing, and it's in people's hands, and they can make up their, their own minds. In a lot of ways, Halo 4 kind of represents like the next era for this franchise. Um, and Halo 3 ended with kind of like an open-ended conclusion, but you know, it, it felt like a good sort of coda for that storyline. Uh, do you feel like you guys are smoothly transitioning people from from that sort of like there was kind of a placid, you know, escape capsule drifting off into the into the forever, uh, and all of a sudden, you know, you're back on the ground shooting stuff again. So, do you feel like people are going to get a smooth transition back into the action at the beginning of this game? Yeah, I think what you just described is very literal chronologically. I mean, the game the game takes place immediately after the events of uh, Halo Three, with the caveat that there's been four years of cryo sleep. But I mean, it's just like you went to bed that night and woke mm-hmm. up the next morning. So that that's kind of we wanted to feel as familiar familiar as that. Um, of course, the the stuff that happens as soon as you wake up uh, has definitely changed. And there's, you start, you know, as you go through the sort of little bits of plot and combat, you start asking questions, why am I fighting these guys? What's going on? In the context of all that, tell me about the importance of the color orange. Uh, <laughs> I can't go into that for reasons you probably are familiar with at this point. I've got, I've got a sneaking there, suspicion. There, there are uh, blue uh, Prometheans and there are uh, orange Prometheans and uh, there are blue buildings and there are orange buildings and there is a specific reason for some of that. One of the uh, little behind the scenes pieces you guys put out, your art director was talking about kind of like deconstructing and breaking the sort of visual or design language of the, the Forerunner stuff. Yeah. You know, it's like everybody knows what it looks like, you know, it's very angular with a lot of blue lights and stuff. Uh, what was the thinking behind kind of moving away from that that visual style that everybody's so used to and do you feel like people are going to kind of be able to, to yeah. transition to this new stuff? I think that, uh, I mean, what there's, there's a, there is an important piece of context missing from how Kenneth described it, which is he's talking about what Requiem is, which is this world that you explore in, uh, in previous Halo games and other pieces of the Halo universe. And this will continue again. You're finding uh, relics and artifacts and abandoned structures that are lifeless and dead, and, and this is what they look like now, you know, 100,000 years later. The whole point of Requiem is that it's a living, breathing, functioning forerunner space. So one of the first questions we asked is, what is this stuff do how does it behave and how does it look when it's inhabited and populated and alive and functioning and we uh one of the one of the things we decided early on is that it has to be it has to be recognizable when you look at some of the the objects that are you know towering over the the landscapes and you're like yeah that's forerunner i get that's the foreign aesthetic but everything is alive now and everything is literally lit up from inside and full of energy and sort of menace and mystery and all that stuff so i mean for people who are really invested in the halo fiction prometheans equals forerunners or does is there does it go deeper than that um it does go deeper than that i, I can't really get into it but absolutely you're fighting uh, effectively forerunner warriors but there's there's a little bit more to the story that will be revealed in the campaign okay so uh, the series obviously is pretty well known for some cr- crazy ass weapons you know, the Needler is a good example, fuel rod, cannon, like lots of weird stuff in the arsenal there. And you have this whole new faction that you have to arm in this game. Was it hard to come up with a bunch of new ideas for, for weird new weapons, uh, given everything that's already come before? Um, some of it is, you know, we need the, you know, and light rifle is a good equivalent. Of like, uh, you know, what would the, what would a forerunner infantry weapon be like? Well, it would be better, right? So in, in the simple version of that is that it's half BR, half DMR. Mm-hmm. Um, what would the forerunner equivalent of a shotgun be? And we have the scatter shot. So in, in each of the instances where we've repeated the basic function of a weapon, we've changed it up a little bit. And the light rifle, of course, serves dual purpose, and it fits between those two roles nicely. And the scatter shot allows you to bank shots very effectively. It's not just a it's not just a small part of it. It's a, it's a, it's a really important part of how you actually use that weapon. And, and as you get better and better at it, you'll start to find out that there's a different skill curve on the the forerunner weapons that isn't just about their basic functionality but it's about their sometimes their secondary functionality and sometimes their role specific purpose but ultimately there we, we had to make the sandbox uh, familiar at least so that people can pick things up and I hope when you were playing through especially campaign you'll pick up a weapon and you're able to experiment with it very quickly on the fly just before something comes and attacks you mm-hmm. and figure out roughly how to use it I was watching one of the guys earlier do, do that exact same thing with the bolt pistol the bolt shot and, uh, and he didn't realize that you could charge it like a shotgun 
uh, until his second encounter, but it was nice to watch people kind of muddle through that really quickly and, and uh, reflexively based on their, their prior experience with Halo. As a new studio, this is your first Halo game. Obviously, you've been on others, but from kind of just the code base level, did you guys take any of the work that Bungie had previously done to build on just just in pursuit of maintaining like the feel of the movement and the enemy behavior and the weapons like was it was it like an iterative effort in that sense if a Bungie engineer came and looked at the engine now he'd see that almost every single system has been tinkered with and rewritten rebuilt from the ground up blah 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 but he would absolutely know his way around it because right. at the core of it is the Halo engine and some of that is the, the sheer flexibility and scale and, and power of that engine I mean it's underutilized in a, in a, in a sense in that only Halo games are using it right and there's been a a lot of work done especially in, the, in terms of graphics to really update things but a lot of stuff was really strong to begin with and we're, we're really lucky to have had that legacy because it solves so many things right off the bat that new franchises have to solve for through invention and we were very lucky it was very luxurious to be able to say okay our basic gunplay mechanic exists is solved for and is and is what much loved right we didn't have to solve for that i think if you were building a new studio and a new franchise you would have to solve for the, the technology part the feel the, the everything so we've been very very lucky in that regard but it's absolutely a sort of continuation of the halo engine it's probably the biggest recalibration of that engine since we moved to uh, power PC cores on the 360. Um, but ultimately, there's pieces in there that, that Bungie engineers would know very well. Um, and we're uh, grateful to them for the, the legacy of, of code and invention that they, they sat in front of us. So uh, Spartan Ops is, a, is kind of a, a unique component of this package yeah. because... You know, the rest of it has to ship on a disc and get out the door, but, but that's going to continue for many weeks after the, after release. Are you guys way ahead of the curve on that stuff, or is that going to be kind of a up to the minute, you know, just sort of by the seat of the pants, getting those episodes done week by week as they're going out? The, the gameplay and the geometry are all done. It's, uh, it's mostly the sort of episodic fiction, which is running just like a TV series. Um, the beauty of that is it does give us time to tune and tweak and test the 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 gameplay longer than we would have in a normal cycle because it would have you two you're right it all would have had to be maintained on the disc as is um so this gave us just a little bit longer to tinker with that stuff but the uh the fiction is being done just like a tv series in that it won't even be finished when the first episode airs we'll still be tuning and, and tweaking the cg on the last episodes uh once the november 6th rolls around so. by the time people uh see this interview it's going to be about a week and a half from this recording so i want you to predict for us what you think your mental state is going to be at that time a week and a half i'm going to be in a pretty good mental state yeah. Yeah, the, uh, but uh, a couple of days after that, I'm going on the worst, most grueling uh, press tour I've ever seen in terms of how it sits on my calendar. It doesn't even look possible. It looks like uh, it's like the Amazing Race or something. You'll probably see me like rushing through various European airports uh, begging for dollars. Nice. But so whether the game will be kind of close to wrapping up at that point, yeah. this insane crunch will be winding down. The game's like 99% done now. It's just sort of uh, getting it in shape for certification and then manufacture and then just cleaning out last minute bugs and, and getting ready for launch. I mean, the, you know, the, there's no parking spaces in the parking lot finally, like not a lot. But uh, we've been, you know, we, we, we have more people than parking spots. And it's, it's a g good sign when you see that parking spots are starting to free up. Sure. Well, that's good to hear. Uh, I wish you guys much peace and sanity as you wrap the game up. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you.